In 1755, the naturalist Stefan Krishanikov observed the Amanita muscaria mushroom's effect on Russian soldiers in Siberia ingesting it for the first time. Claiming to have been seized by an invisible power, the men submitted to the mushroom's strange and often violent commands. A servant strangled his master. A soldier found himself ordered to his knees and confessed his sins before God. Krishnikov's interpreter drank some mushroom liquor and went into such a frenzy that he slashed open his abdomen on the command of mucumor, or the mushroom. One soldier who ate this mucumor found a certain dose reduced his fatigue while marching, but after eating more of the mushrooms, he gripped his testicles and died. Krishnikov's report seems to describe the response drug-naive users can have to GABAergic delirients, which act on a neurotransmitter that reduces the transmission of excitatory impulses in about half the brain's neurons. Subsequent centuries of eager reporting on the Outrayer customs he had described culminated in an extermination campaign begun under Stalin and continued by the KGB that is said to have completely eradicated traditional Amanita muscaria use by 1980. While operatives were systematically destroying the ostensibly anti-communist Siberian mushroom traditions via a series of assassinations in which shamans were reportedly thrown from helicopters, plunged into the frozen lakes, or simply shot, with their drums kept as trophies, biochemists internationally were recognizing the enormous value of muscimol a psychoactive alkaloid produced by Amanita muscaria, which instead of changing the activity of endogenous GABA, actually replaces it in the brain. A team of Danish researchers led by the medicinal chemist and GABA expert, Polv Kravsgaard Larsen, began synthesizing and publishing on dozens of muscimol derivatives. One molecule created in 1977 stood out a derivative that, like muscimol itself, behaved as a direct agonist of the GABA-A receptor and could be ingested orally. Furthermore, it was less toxic than muscimol. This compound would come to be known as gaboxidol. Until relatively recently, self-experimentation was a vital component of drug discovery. So when Krogsgaard Larsen recognized the uniqueness of gaboxidol, he ingested the drug in increasing doses to characterize its qualitative effects. We had blunt blood samples taken continuously, he told me. Normally I'm scared of blood and I don't like the pain of needles, but this time I was not scared and there was no pain whatsoever. At 10 milligrams, the general feeling I had when I was walking around was just as if I had had two or three beers. It was a very comfortable feeling. Krogar Larsen filed for a patent for gaboxidol and transferred it to the pharmaceutical company Lundbeck. Then came a surge of human testing. Given that gaboxidol was the product of investigations into the active principle of a mushroom that has since at least the 17th century been recognized for inducing a hallucinogenic delirium, a delirium profound enough that many Siberians used specialized wooden bowls to steal and save the urine of those who had partaken. Its unusual side effects should have been predictable, yet from the very beginning, Gaboxidol suffered something of an identity crisis. As is often the case in the testing of new drugs, the first trial population was mentally ill. 18 patients with tardative dyskinesia a movement disorder that afflicts long-term users of antipsychotic drugs were administered daily doses ranging from 10 milligrams to the potentially deliriogenic 120 milligrams. There was no change in their repetitive movements, but they were side effects, sedation, confusion, and dizziness. One schizophrenic man remained in a confusional state for three hours, followed by amnesia for the episode. The authors concluded that the doses may have been too low to produce the desired anti-hyperkinetic effect, suggesting gaboxidol might work better as an anti-anxiety drug. Then came 14 patients with advanced stage cancer in a trial testing gaboxidol as a non-narcotic, non-addictive analgesic. Intramuscular gaboxidol injections proved effective against malignant cancer pain, 
without causing the breathing problems that underlie most opiate-related fatalities. Patients reported euphoria, the feeling of having drunk a couple of beers too many, and a closed sensation in the head. Two found Gaboxidol's hypnotic effect so strong that they lost consciousness entirely. Following the lead suggested by the unsuccessful tardative dyskinesia study, clinicians at John Hopkins tested Gaboxidol in eight patients with generalized anxiety disorder. While the drug did to some degree ease their symptoms, though not significantly more than placebo, once again patients spoke of side effects. Five of the eight reported feelings of unreality. One described dreamlike illusions similar to those she had previously experienced during a high fever. Additionally, there were feelings of giddiness, depersonalization, and of course sleepiness. Whether Gaboxidol truly lacked efficacy or simply confused anxious patients accustomed to Valium's gentle, non-hallucinatory languor is unclear. What is clear is that the drug had yet to find its niche. Most of the commonly encountered GABAergic drugs, Valium, Ambien, Xanax, alcohol, exert their effect on the GABA-A receptor, thereby increasing the effectiveness of the GABA already circulating naturally in the human brain. But both Muscimol and Gaboxidol exert their effect independent of endogenous GABA concentrations, replacing native, native GABA on the neuron. For this reason, Larson suggested Gaboxidol might be a viable treatment for Huntington's disease. Gaboxidol failed to reduce the involuntary movements that characterized the disease. One patient reported hallucina hallucinations in the moments before sleep, and all five participants experienced somnolence and disassociation. There were further trials employing Gaboxidol as an intervention for epilepsy, mania, and spasticity, all of them characterized by the same mix to negative results on the target disorder and the unavoidable desire to sleep. Krogard Larson published a review in the journal Neuropharmacology defending the potential of Gaboxidol in the face of the repeated clinical failures of the early 1980s, calling for more human trials and dismissing the reported side effects as little more than a new drug's useful indiscretions. Certainly nothing an enteric coating couldn't fix. In no place did he propose that the side effects might be the very properties that define Gaboxidol's potential as a pharmaceutical. And so the drug was shelved. Save for a single unsuccessful trial that employed an unprecedentedly high 160 mg dose in Alzheimer's patients, Gaboxidol spent the next decade dancing across the GABA-A receptors of rodents and occasionally grivet monkeys but neglecting the large, sleep-disordered brain of man. Then, in 1996, Marie Lancel, a somnologist at the Max Planck Institute for Psychiatry in Munich, made the connection that had eluded her predecessors. She noted, in a trial involving rats, that Gaboxidol not only induced sleep effectively, but also preserved sleep's natural architecture. Traditionally, benzodiazepine hypnotics, such as the aforementioned Valium and Xanax, suppress the REM cycle, but Gaboxidol leaves REM undisturbed while lengthening the duration of slow-wave sleep, a dreamful stage of non-REM sleep considered important for memory consolidation and feelings of restedness. The drug was reintroduced to cl clinical trials and performed exceptionally in human testing showing comparable efficacy to the industry standard Ambien without causing the reband insomnia that typically follows Ambien cessation. In rodents, Gaboxidol could be administered repeatedly without the development of tolerance, and it did not interact synergistically with alcohol as virtually all other hypnotics do. Because the average duration of slow-wave sleep decreases with age, the drug was found particularly effective in the elderly. Merck offered to pay Lundbeck $270 million for the rights to sell Gaboxidol in the United States and predicted the drug would bring in $350 million in profits by 2009. It was during this frenzy of clinical and big pharma interests with articles flooding the pages of scientific journals such as Sleep that I heard about Gaboxidol and decided to try it. 
By 2007, Gaboxidol had entered Phase 3 clinical trials, and Lundbeck had established an office in Pennsylvania to oversee the U.S. sales of the drug they hoped would usurp some of the $1.5 billion in sales boasted the previous year by Sanofo's Ambien. Then it happened again. Lundbeck announced that developments would be discontinued, citing the findings of a study, the details of which have never been published. On a panel of drug abusers who experienced hallucinations and other psychiatric side effects at high doses. Merck's representatives, meanwhile, cited a lack of efficacy. It must be noted that this was a time of great sleep anxiety for the pharmaceutical industry. Starting in 2006, the media was flooded with bizarre reports of ambient induced delirium. Patrick Kennedy woke up in his sun ambiguously crashed Mustang convertible. People discovered empty food containers in their bed, evidence of uncontrollable bouts of nocturnal binge eating. An Australian woman awoke with a brush in hand to find she had repainted her front door, and a teenager reportedly stole his mother's credit card to purchase four alpacas that he could neither afford nor care for. Tiger Woods' mistress, Rochelle Euchanel, said he exploited the drug for its disinhibitory aphrodisial properties, proudly declaring, we have crazy ambient sex. Perhaps the seers at Merck predicted a similar fate for gaboxidol. The cardiotoxicity of the arthritis drug Vioxx had resulted in 2004 in the biggest pharmaceutical recall since Fenfen and wound up costing the company's billions in settlements. Merck was suddenly, understandably, less willing to compete against generic Ambien in the race to hypnotize America. The company's choice may have deprived millions of insomnia sufferers access to safe and non-addictive treatment, but it's, ne- it's best not to dwell on the counterfactual. Maybe Merck's prognostications were correct. Maybe they saved us from a new generation of delirious gaboxidol habituates, wooden urine bowls in hand, ceremonially recycling the waters of life, while the company's profits pour down the drain. Like muscimol, gaboxidol is excreted almost entirely unchanged in the urine. Maybe insomniacs shrouded in animal skins would have swarmed pharmacies hoping to barter reindeers for prescriptions while beating drums to accelerate the FDA's approval of a generic gaboxidol formulation. No, Merck would not have that. This is all to say that my hope of trying gaboxidol crumbled like an Amanita muscaria in the sun. The synthesis of gaboxidol is not so difficult as it is tedious. Povilkarsgård Larsen's original process starts with a commercially unavailable precursor and requires at least six synthetic steps before arriving at a product with abysmally low yields, the sort of drug that must be made industrially and with much optimization to be economically feasible. Conversely, Ambien can be prepared in a single step, one pot reaction with a 72% yield. The combination of practical unattainability and miraculous clinical results elevated gaboxidol to near mythic statutes among pharma pipeline, savvy insomniacs, and the hypnotic cognizance. Gaboxidol seemed exemplary of a pharmaceutical industry that would prefer to sell minimally effective drugs devoid of side effects than medicines which might possess a therapeutic effect but put the mark the maker at risk of litigation. And then, for all my searching, Gaboxidol in the end found me. While looking for supplies in the catalog of a small Copenhagen laboratory, I found Gaboxidol for the astonishingly low price of $20 a gram, a significant improvement over the $1,000 charged by the multinational chemical supplier Sigma Aldrich. Within a week, I had a bag containing 2 grams of brilliant white powder, complete with 1H and 13C nuclear magnetic resonance spectra indicating its molecular structure. I had read and reread the results of almost every published clinical trial and so wasted no time in weighing out a 20 milligram dose and dropping it into my mouth. Within 15 minutes I began to feel the effects. There was no euphoria, no psychedelic ideation, and no command hallucinations except perhaps lie down and go to sleep. 
That night I fell asleep three hours before my usual 4 a.m. bedtime and enjoyed a profoundly restful, uninterrupted night of slumber. One that could not have been better had Hypnos himself come to tuck me in a velvet bed in a cave surrounded by murmuring rivers of fermenting sulfuric herbs. This was not the black, concussed, coma sleep some hypnotics afford. Rather, it felt like the effortless sleep experienced after a day of strong physical exertion. It felt like healthy sleep, like true sleep. The next night I increased the dose to 35 milligrams sublingually, and it was then that Gaboxidol's relationship to Muscomol became manifest. In my, in my darkened bedroom, I could hear otherworldly music emanating from the motor of a box fan. The white noise buzzing slowing, taking on the character of an electric viola. The room's various shadows animated by strange movements, as if cast by a flickering candle. But none of this proved distracting. Once again, I fell into an all-consuming slumber. The following days, I used it again and again and again. And when I stopped taking it, I was amazed to find there was indeed no withdrawal or discontinuation related insomnia. Apparently the rumors were true. Gaboxidol was the perfect hypnotic. I decided to send off a sample to the material to a toxicologist friend for a gas chromatography mass spectroscopy analysis. When the results came back, they were not consistent with Gaboxidol rather indicating the chemical ibotenic acid, a brain lesioning agent. In life, there are things that can serve to boost your self-esteem, such as a new romance or an unprompted compliment from a stranger. And there are things that do not boost your self-esteem, such as learning that you have spent the past two weeks repeatedly poisoning yourself with a high-potency brain lesioning agent. The morning I read the results of this GCMS analysis, I didn't get out of bed, staying motionless for a long time, thinking about how I would never able to be I would never be able to think again. There was the possibility that assuming I had incurred irre irreversible brain damage was hypochondriacal. Like muscamol, ibotanic acid is an alkaloid present in the Amanita muscaria mushroom, yet none of the numerous Amanita muscaria poisonings in the toxico toxicological literature suggested lasting cognitive dysfunction, and most studies on ibotenic acid-induced brain lesioning involved direct intracerebral injection. Humans have experimented consumed doses of pure ibotenic acid as high as 100 milligrams without noted neurological after-effects, but none of this changed the fact that there were more than 40 scientific publications with the word Ibotenic acid and lesion in their title. Perhaps one of the most frightening things about the human mind is how poorly it gauges its own functioning, and more specifically detects its own def deficits. Things, quick things quickly became complicated when you attempt to measure the performance of an instrument with the instrument being measured. In 1969, a Dutch psychiatrist named Hermann von Prague conducted a series of experiments on depressed patients with a new drug, 4-chloroamphetamine, which he found exerted a significant therapeutic effect and was tolerated excellently. Not a single patient complained of side effects. Though Prague discontinued his work by the mid-70s, 4-chloroamphetamine is still used widely today, not only as an antidepressant, but a as a neurotoxin for selectively destroying serotonin-producing neurons in experimental animals. The point being that humans cannot necessarily feel changes in their own brains. With many disorders of the brain comes a commensurate inability to notice. The later stages of Alzheimer's, for example, are in many people characterized by a denial of the disease entirely. But I could feel the deficits, a reduction in working memory, impaired focus, decreased verbal fluency. I spent my subway rides deeply engaged in thoughts of metacognition and thoughts about thinking about metacognition. The Dunning-Kruger effect and the distant hope of advancements in neural grafting. I became extremely uncomfortable with the word lesion and avoided it whenever possible, but whether I liked it or not, 
lesions were on my mind. It wasn't just that I was plagued by worry, the worry was also keeping me up at night, and I slowly became accustomed to watching the sun rise while internally debating how strong the lesioning capabilities of sublingually administered ibotenic acid could be relative to those observed with the intracerebral check injection. That the sample would have been ibotenic acid though seemed very strange. Most scientific suppliers sell ibotenic acid for a much higher price than gaboxidol. It's an old saw that lesioning the brains of your customers with glutamatic exotoxins is bad for business. I began to wonder whether gaboxidol could behave like a structurally similar ibotenic acid when subjected to the high oven temperatures of GCMS. I brought the sample back to my friend's lab and we repeated the nuclear magnetic resonance analysis to check against both the vendor's spectra and a reference in the patient literature. Gaboxidol contains two important carbon atoms that distinguish its structure from that of ibotenic acid, and each of them is bound by two hydrogen atoms that produce a unique signal not present in ibotenic acid. When I saw the signal of these hydrogens, I was overjoyed, experiencing the spontaneous neuroregeneration that would allow me to do things like write articles about the heartbreak of psychogenetic brain damage. Since Merck's 2007 discontinuation, Gaboxidol has been unsuccessfully tried as an adjunct to SSRI-based antidepressant therapy, but all subsequent analyses have further supported its efficacy as a hypnotic, partially in the elderly. Most recently, Gaboxidol allowed 101 test patients to fall asleep and remain asleep while exposed to a recorded stream of continuous road traffic noise. I keep my small amount of remaining gaboxidol in a vial as an analytic reference and a reminder of the nocebo's effect, awesome power. And now I'll make do with some warm chamomile tea, time-release melatonin, and the occasional wooden bowl of muscomole urine. <laughs>